and welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and it's such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you. And I'm so glad for this opportunity we have, and hope that you will be able to take a moment to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study as we spend time together in the Book of God. As always, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ, and we're so thankful that we have this occasion, that we can come together, we can study, we can learn, and know what the Book of God has to say. What I'd like for us to think about as a subject I've simply called unsaved believers. Now, that might seem kind of strange uh, to some folks, and because so many times we've been told that, you know, whenever you're a saved person, uh, when you're saved, you're saved at the point of faith, and point of faith only, point of faith alone. And so to talk about an unsaved believer uh, to them is going uh, not not to sound normal because you say, well, wait a minute, how can you be unsaved and be a believer at the same time if belief is what make, is what saves you? And really, that's my point. What we want us what we want to do uh, for the next little bit is to look into God's Word and to notice and see that when it comes to the subject of salvation, we must believe. But it's more than just believing or faith only that's going to do it. In fact, in your Bibles, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we can start there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when I think about uh, the, without faith it's impossible to please God, that's one side of this coin. That without faith it's impossible to please God. So please don't walk away from, from this program and say, well, Brother Jacobs doesn't believe in faith, or Brother Jacobs doesn't think faith is important. Well, that's not it at all. Uh, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if you're going to come to God, you must believe that he is. And that, by the way, ties in with John chapter 8 and verse 24, where he said, if you believe not that I am he, you'll die in your sins. So Hebrews 11 and verse 6, when he says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To reward those who diligently seek is talking about action right there. So it takes more than faith, even in that verse Hebrews 11, 6. It takes more than faith because you must diligently seek. To diligently seek has to do with action. has to do with things that I'm doing, that I'm a part of, that I'm, I'm acting on. In the book of James chapter 2, as another passage we can t- talk about. In James chapter 2 and verse 24. He says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And James chapter 2 verse 26, he talks about as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so in James chapter 2 verse 24, James chapter 2 verse 26, two passages that show us that faith alone or faith only is not enough to save you. Sometimes we... Uh, when we're talking to folks, they'll say, well, you know, but the Bible says that, you know, faith saves you and so forth. And, uh, you know, by grace are you saved through faith, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. And to that I would say, amen. Yes, faith saves. There's no question that faith saves you. And I already showed you Hebrews 11, 6, that says without faith it's impossible to please God. But the point we need to remember is don't insert the word only there with the word faith. In other words, it doesn't say, by grace are you saved through faith only, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Because if you keep reading Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, and then verse 9 and verse 10 talks about how that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And so even in the very passage that some would want to say, you know, teaches faith only, it doesn't, but even those who'd say that, the very passage that talks about faith also says that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So there's good works that we have to do, good works that we have to be about. And so those things go together. In fact, true faith will motivate, motivate me to obey anyways. That's what it does. True faith motivates me to obey, to do what the Lord says. Because whenever I believe what he has said, and whenever I believe the truth, and I even believe the consequences of what God has said, then I'm going to do what he has said. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to obey it. You know, you, you think about Jesus Christ on the cross. And whenever Jesus Christ is on the cross, we see here how that Jesus uh, being on the cross do I believe that or not? 
If I believe that, and if I believe that is an event that really occurred, and I really believe that Jesus Christ died upon the cross, and he's a sacrifice because of my sin, and I truly believe that, then I will change my life. I truly believe that, then I'll stop doing some things that I have been doing. I'll start doing things that I hadn't done before. I will obey him. And whenever he says to follow me, and whenever he says to believe on me, to repent of your sins and be baptized, then that's exactly what I'm going to do. Not because a man said to do it, but because Christ said to do it. And here he is dying upon the cross, uh, not for anything he has done, but because of what I've done then I'm going to respond in kind and I'm going to respond to him say, yes, I will serve you. Like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 and 15, just to paraphrase, but he just he says, just as Christ died for us, we need to live for him. And so isn't that the point? Isn't that what we find here? And so think about that. But again, we talk about unsaved believers. You say, how's that possible? How's it possible to be an unsaved believer? Well, it's possibly an unsaved believer if someone at the point of faith just doesn't go any farther. I'll give you an example. In the book of Mark chapter 5, and about really about the first 20 verses, it's a, it's a long reading. But in Mark chapter 5, it talks about the time that Jesus went into to gathering. Or some versions will say the Gergesenes or the Gadarenes or Gadara and that kind of thing. But uh, it was an area just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And now he'd been on the what would be considered the, the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And that's over toward Capernaum and that's over toward those areas. And the Bible says that he went from there and went across... Uh, there, so he's he's going to the other side now to Gadara or the area of the Gadarenes or Gergesenes. He's going over into that area, which again, from from uh, the area that he was, that was more on the western side of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias, and now he's going over toward the eastern side and on on that other side, uh, technically uh, just outside of the property, if you will, outside the boundary, that's a better word, outside the boundary of Israel. And so here he is going over there on a ship, and he said there was a fellow with an unclean spirit. In fact, there was a few of them that had an unclean spirit. And the people there had tried to tie him down, had tried to hold him down with chains, and it didn't work. He'd, he'd rip through the chains. He was uh, possessed with, with a devil. And evidently, there was a few of these uh, men like this, and they had many devils or many demons in them. This is the time when Jesus sees this, and there's a great herd of swine that was feeding, and he cast the demons out into the herd of the swine, and then the swine ran off the cliff and down into the Sea of Galilee, and, and they all drowned and died. Well, when that happens, the people uh, come out to see what's going on, and they see this these ones that at one time were wild men and dwelling in the, in the uh, tombs and things and, and you couldn't hold them with chains and so forth and all of that. And now they're seated, they're clothed in their right mind listening to Jesus just outside of town. The people see this and they see what's going on and they see that the swine herd is gone and they beg Jesus to leave. They beg him to turn away. Now, they didn't deny that Jesus did what he did. They believed it. And you can see this because they went to Jesus concerning these things. The Bible says they went to him. And when they did, they said they begged him to leave. Now, here's my, my point. The reason why we know they believe this event really happened was why did they beg Jesus to leave unless they believed he'd done it? I mean, if they didn't believe he did it and they believe this is some kind of accident and some kind of weird thing with the pigs, then why did they run Jesus out of town? I can tell you exactly why they ran Jesus out of town. It's because they believed he did it, and he did do it. And they didn't want to evidently lose anything else. I guess losing pigs was enough for the day. They didn't want to, uh, you know, if Jesus got into town, who knows what he would have done. And so out of their fear... Out of all of that, they, they sent him away. But it wasn't from a lack of faith. They believed he did it. But that did not save them at all. It didn't make their souls one whit better. It didn't change a thing about that. 
though, like I said, they, they had to believe Jesus was responsible or they wouldn't have blamed him. And here these folks were. They have turned their backs on the very Lord of heaven as a result. Yes, you can have unsaved believers. I'll give you another example. In John chapter 12 and verse 42 and 43, if you turn over to John chapter 12 and verse 42 and verse number 43, he says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Now I want you to notice verse 42. Many believed on him, but they would not confess. Verse 43. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So here these folks are. He says there's chief rulers and folks like this, and they believed on Christ. Somebody says, well, you believe on Christ, and it's that salvation, all right? Well, if you believe on Christ, and that's where salvation is, I want you to notice that next phrase, they would not confess him. Well, if you believe on Christ, but you won't confess him, uh, does that mean you're saved anyways? Is Jesus one day going to, to welcome into heaven all these people and he calls believers and they wouldn't confess him? Uh, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Jesus is going to say, well, that didn't matter at all. You can love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You don't even have to confess me. Just as long as you believe, well, come on up into heaven. Now, does that even make sense? Would it make sense to somebody who has saving faith Somebody who has the faith that's going to save them from all their sins, and yet they won't even confess him? I imagine somebody at this point might say, well, you know, if you don't confess, then you really didn't believe in the first place. And so that's the answer to that. You know, you didn't confess. You really don't believe because you never confess. It's kind of like, uh, you know, well, let me, let me not jump ahead. So you go to this. All right, well, let's just look here. They also believed on him. Now, an argument that would say, well, they don't really believe. You know, they don't really believe him because they didn't really confess him. Uh, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God, so that means they really didn't believe. Well, wait a minute. That's not what that verse said, though. Now, this verse that we're reading about is written by inspiration. The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle John to write down what's in this book. Or in this, yes, the particular book, book of John. Now, the Holy Spirit inspired John to write down what's said here. Now, if that's the case, was John fooled? Was the Holy Spirit fooled by these people? Because this, these words say that they believe. Doesn't say they thought they believed, or didn't say that they really didn't believe, even though they said they did. They really didn't. That's not what that verse says. It doesn't say they really didn't believe. It says they believed on him. Now, here's belief. Here's someone with faith. They believe. The chief rulers believed on him, but they wouldn't confess. They believed on him. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. What are we going to do with something like that? What are we going to do with this? And, and uh, are we going to keep on holding to a doctrine that says salvation is by faith only, faith alone? Or will we let go of that false doctrine and accept a true doctrine here that says, you know what, faith is absolutely necessary, but faith is not the end point. It is absolutely necessary. I already read you the verse in Hebrews eleven six. It's absolutely, it's impossible to please God without faith. Don't ever deny that. But at the same time, faith alone, faith by itself is not the end point. That's not the be all and end all of it. That's not the point of salvation. Now you can't have salvation without faith, but that's not the end point. And it shows you right here in John chapter 12. They believed on him, but they didn't confess. Now, if, if you believe something so strongly, it seemed to me like you'd confess that. You'd tell people about it. You would state you, that you believe it, and you believe it without a doubt. You believe it 100%. I mean, are there not things in life that you say, I believe this 100%. I believe this all the way. And how do I know you believe it? Because you just told me. That's confession. Now, these people wouldn't confess they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, if you love the praise of men more than the praise of God, how can you be a saved person? And again, we go back to that circular logic here. It says, well, they didn't really believe in the first place. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. They did really believe. They absolutely believed. 
And you know it from that verse. He didn't say they didn't really believe. They believed on him. Friends, you can be an unsaved believer. I don't want you to be that way. I don't want you to take part in something like that that would you would be an unsaved person, but at the same time believing that's just right up here to the edge. You're just not there. You need to go ahead and take the next step. I don't know why people won't, but sometimes that's what happens in it. And so we've got to watch that. We've got to make sure in our lives we're not an unsaved believer, but that we are a saved believer. And so, yes, it takes faith, but it takes something else, doesn't it? It takes faith, but I can't just love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I can't say that I believe, but I won't confess him. Again, that's, that doesn't make much sense, does it? Oh, yes, I believe on Christ and all, all this mentally going on. Oh, I believe in Christ and I believe he told the truth and I believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Oh, yes, I believe all these things. And then I turn around in my day-to-day life and I won't confess it. I won't talk about it and won't even discuss it. That doesn't even make good nonsense, does it? That, that, that's not a saved person. And somebody might believe you might be to that point, but you're not a saved person. If I'm talking to people right now that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you believe that he is Christ's Son, you believe he died upon the cross, you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you believe in, in the words that he has spoken and you say the words he has spoken are true words. If you believe on that and you're to that point, why won't you take the next step? Why are you allowing the praise of men to hold you back? Or why are you allowing your fear to hold you back? Why are you allowing other things to hold you and keep you back from what you know you need to do? Think seriously about that. Look in the book of Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, this is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount spends some time. and, And again, we'll see this same idea about faith and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. Here's unsaved believers, people who were saved, who are not saved, though they believed, though they believed on the Lord. And you just see this over and over again. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, for example, verse 21. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Hmm. What a horrible thing to hear what a tragic thing to hear and that's what he says not everyone that just says lord lord is going to do it they're not going to go to heaven just because they said lord lord and again he says you have to do the will of my father which is in heaven that's the key point right there you talk about unsaved believers folks here's a passel of them we're going to look at here in just a moment But here folks who said they believed, they were saying that. They said, Lord, Lord. In other words, as calling out to Christ, calling him Lord. The word Lord means ruler or sovereign. Oh, you're the Lord of my life. You're the sovereign. You're the ruler of my life. You're the one with the absolute authority. Oh, yes, that's you, Lord. That is you. And in the very next uh, statement made, he hadn't even taken a breath. In the very next statement, he says, but you did not obey me. He says, uh, those folks, verse 21, he says, you have to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You've got to do it. And to not do it results in tragedy. To not do it results in lost souls. Let me pause for a moment and remind you, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ. The Caneyville Church of Christ meets together on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. for Bible study, 1045 for morning worship, and 5 in the afternoon for worship. We also meet Wednesday night at 7 for a period of Bible study, and we'd love to see you. We'd love for you to come be with us at any and every time that you can. We meet right across the road from the Sacramento Bank, there near the intersection of Highway 62 and Highway 79 in Caneyville, Kentucky, in Grayson County. We'd love to see you. We'd love for you to come be with us at any and every time that you can. If you'd like, you can, you can come visit with us. Uh, you can ask your Bible questions. Uh, we would love to talk to you about your Bible questions. We'd love to study with you and talk to you about things of a spiritual nature.
We'd, uh, of course, uh, you can go to our, our Facebook page. You can look us up, Caneyville Church of Christ. Look us up on Facebook and like us and follow us. You can go to our website, CaneyvilleChurchofChrist.com. And these are available to you 24 hours a day. And you can... Uh, you know, have access to reading material, to sermons, to to videos, to all kinds of things like that. They're all available for, to you uh, 24 hours a day. You can write us. You can uh, ask your questions and so forth. If you're interested in a Bible correspondence course, we can set that up. They're absolutely free. Uh, just call me, 589-4167. You can call me. You can text me at that number. Uh, but just let me know you're interested in a Bible correspondence course. And we will set that up. Uh, we've set several of them up, by the way, through emails and texts and all kinds of good stuff. And so we'd love to do that. And love for you, if you're interested in more Bible study like that, we can, we can do that. It's absolutely free. You're not even going to pay for a stamp. We'll pay for the stamp. We'll pay for the envelope, the lessons, the everything. It's there. We're not soliciting your money. We're just soliciting your time. That you might uh, sit down with God's Word, study it, and learn what the Book of God has to say. If you'd like to have a sit-down Bible study with us, and just to sit down together at the kitchen table, as it were, to sit down together at at uh, you know at a restaurant, and we'll sit down and drink a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about God's Word. And you want to do something like that, just know that you're welcome to do it. Again, call me, 589-4167. Uh, you can text me. You can call me. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to you about these things of spiritual nature. And I have gotten several phone calls from folks, and I just want to say how much I appreciate that. I've gotten texts from folks and uh, all kinds of things. And so uh, I just love to hear from you. I've heard from folks in different states even and, and different places, and they, they get a hold of the program uh, in various ways, whether it's through the radio, whether it's through the internet and, and different things. And through that, uh, we've had some good conversations and good studies together, and we encourage you, to just if you have any Bible questions, just let me know. I'd love to talk to you and love to study with you, and especially folks here local, close by, where, where we can talk together, we can study, and then you can come see, it, see us at Caneyville and come see it live and in person. And I think that you'll be blessed because you did. And I'm sure there's folks here that you know that, that come to church here with us. And I know they'd love to see you. And I know that we'd love to have you with us at any and every time that you can. Well, you can jump back into Matthew chapter 7, talking about unsaved believers. And here's these unsaved believers. He said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The very point we were making from John chapter 12 Jesus is making in Matthew chapter 7. It's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord. Now you say, Lord, Lord, uh, evidently you believe. Uh, there's people that didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There's people that didn't believe. I mean, there's people today like that that don't believe. I didn't tell you about folks who don't believe Jesus even existed as a historical person. And so to talk about that, well, of course they don't believe. But there are folks who do believe, and they believe that Jesus is a historical person, and they believe even that he's the Son of God. That's what is Matthew 7, verse 21. They say, Lord, Lord. But he said, you don't do what I say. Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The, the idea behind iniquity means lawlessness, without law or without authority. You're doing things without authority from me. You're just, you're just doing things just to be doing them. There's no faith involved in this. There's no belief in that sense. Now, you might believe academically that there is a Jesus Christ, but you have no intention of doing what I say. And he said, that's the problem. Whenever you might believe Jesus academically is a real person, but you have no intention of doing what he says, that's the problem. That's the issue. That's why you're an unsaved believer. Because not only must the faith be there, but the faith must motivate me to obey. Hebrews 11 verse 6, who diligently seek him. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, those folks were not diligently seeking Jesus. They weren't doing it. If you've been diligently seeking Jesus, at the end of the day, he wouldn't say, I never knew you. See that? It takes faith and it takes action. It takes both of these together. And it's no accident if you keep on reading Hebrews 11. Now, all we read was Hebrews 11 and verse 6. 
But if you keep on reading Hebrews chapter 11, you're going to read about a number of great faith heroes, uh, starting with, with Abel and going all the way through. And all the way through the book of Hebrews chapter 11, here's this just snapshot, you might say, bang, 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 of all these great faith heroes and the different things that they did. And at, at, as you read that, you see that every one of their lives is connected with faith and obedience. Faith and obedience together. You cannot separate faith and obedience. They're tied together. They are uh, attached or, or tied together in such a way that you can't let them go. Romans chapter 10 and verse 16. He says there, They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report. And that's a reference to he, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 53 and verse number 1. So that's a reference to Isaiah 53, what, what Paul uses in Romans. But Romans 10, verse 16, he said, They have not all obeyed, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report. See, so we'll know the people who have believed, truly believed, when they obey. Now, to believe without obedience is a dead faith. That's James 2, 26. It's a dead faith. And so we need to believe and obey. We need to put those two things together. And don't separate them at all. Don't ever separate those two. If you try to separate them, you're going to have problems. Again, look in the book of Acts with me. In the book of Acts and in chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. The Apostle Paul is on trial at this time. And he's on trial for, uh, well, basically for being a Christian. Is what he's on trial for. Uh, they can't prove anything, but he has uh, gone to Caesar and has uh, basically made an appeal to Caesar to keep from being killed in Jerusalem. That's what it's about. And so now he's going on and eventually going to go to Rome. But on, along the way, he's having these different trials. Well, he has a trial here and stands before a man by the name of Agrippa. And that was his title. But I, I said the name, but that's his title. He is uh, here uh, in charge. And so uh, he's going to hear Paul's case. And what Paul talks about from Acts chapter 26, what he talks about is uh, basically his life. How he had a vision, how the Lord spoke to him and told him he was going to go to Damascus, how he was going to go there and, and learn what to do to be saved. And he did through Ananias. And he was baptized, Acts twenty two sixteen. And now the Bible says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He talks about how I went. And I preached the gospel. I preached the gospel to the Gentiles for all these many years. And he said, now, he said, I've been called in, uh, you know, over over this subject, over the subject of the resurrection and things. And and so the result was that, that Festus said, Thou art beside thyself, much learning hath made thee mad. You're a crazy man. That's what he said about him. I'm not crazy, 25, Acts 26, 25. I'm not crazy, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness for the king, talking about Agrippa now. The king knows these things before whereof I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things were hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know thou believest. Do you agree, believe the prophets, Agrippa? Before he could even answer, he says, I know you believe. Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Yes, Agrippa believed, but he's an unsaved believer. Don't be like that. And we could give other examples, but friends, don't be like that. Don't be an unsaved believer. Be somebody who is saved. Believe on Jesus as the Son of God, as John 8, 24 says, and let that faith motivate you to obey. Let the faith motivate you to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. To confess your faith in Christ. Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, Romans 10, 10. To confess the faith. Don't be like those Pharisees that just believed and didn't confess. Confess him and be baptized for the remission of your sins. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth not shall be damned. So he that believeth and is baptized. So let's do both. If I can help you in any way to not be an unsaved believer, but to be a saved believer, give me a call, 589-4167. Let's talk about these things of spiritual nature and do what the Lord said do. Let's be what the Bible makes us. So thankful for this time and so thankful for our study. And I hope this has been helpful to you. And until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.